Here's the second one. We're going to start with, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Y'all in Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. This kind of mourning is not when someone faces great sorrow in their life or some kind of failure, like when someone dies or if you're, or you're, you're getting a divorce. These kind of mornings, these mornings have a, a limited time. It varies on how long it is. Some of us have a hard time letting someone go. And this kind of morning, the Lord understands it. But at the same time, He uh, He doesn't want you to stay in mourning. Well, this kind of morning, like I said, when you lose someone or a divorce, you know, uh, you mourn for a while after that. Well, your daughter, I mean, you mourn for her, didn't you? Yeah, I, I'm, well, eight months after she passed, after she went to be with the Lord. I'm, in, I'm sitting in church, and for those days, before that happened, you know, I was, amen, I was in, active in the church, and, uh, you know, I've always talked about moving in the Spirit. Well, when that happened, uh, the Lord was carrying me, but I wasn't very active in my Christian. I still went to church, still loved the Lord, but I wasn't, what do you call, excited or stuff like that. Uh, eight months, and I remember eight months after it happened, I'm sitting in church, the pastor's preaching, and I, I know without a doubt, the Lord just spoke to me and said, okay, Jesse, that's enough. And as soon as he said that, I got back to getting active in the church again. But he spoke to me and said, that's enough. But like I said here, it varies for people. Some people, it might be less time. For some people, it might be more time. It might take a year or two years. It's different. It varies for different people. But we don't stay in it. Because if we stay in our morning, the Lord can't use us. He can't use us if, that's, if you're going to stay in that position. The psalmist says in Psalms 42.5, some of these verses you don't have on your paper. You're just going to have to write them down. The psalmist is saying, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? He's mourning right here. And then he says, I will put my hope in God and I will praise him again, my Savior. So there's a time when you go through mourning, but then there's a time you get out of it. You get out, out of you put, you, you put your hope back in the Lord again and you start praising him again as your Savior. Now I do have to say when, when my little girl passed uh, at our services, you know, they were singing songs. Uh, praise songs and and not again it's not because of me or nothing it just when I read the verse it rains on the just and the unjust I believe it so what happened to me uh, I didn't blame God and I didn't get mad at him or anything it just it happened to me okay and while we're singing these songs at her funeral service I had, I had my hands lifted up to the Lord because I was praising God because I, I, that's when I needed Him the most and I didn't want to get away from Him. After that is when I was like mourning, okay? But uh, we need to stay with the Lord like it, like they did, like He said right here. Right now I'm discouraged, my heart is sad, but now i got to get my hope back in the Lord. i got to get back to praising my Savior, He says. So there's a time for mourning. Like I said, it varies, but there's a time for mourning. This kind of mourning... We're not, that's not the kind of mourning we're going to be talking about here in verse 4. It's not talking about when someone dies or, or some great sorrow, sorrow in your life. Verse 4 follows verse 3, which makes clear that to be a born Christian, we must be poor in spirit. We've, we learned that we have to be poor in spirit to become a Christian because we need to know that we're totally bankrupt, spiritually bankrupt, okay, and that we totally need Him. We come empty-handed to the Lord. And this is the only way we can come to Him. And this, this is the only way we should come to Him. Because Romans seven eighteen says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. we got to remember that. Without the Lord, there's nothing good in us without the Lord. So once you become born in spirit, mourning follows. Because you realize you've been sinning against the one who loves you. This morning we're going to be we're, we're going to be speaking about it's going to be mourning over sin. 
Psalm, uh, David says in Psalms 51.4, Against thee and thee only have I sinned. So once we become a born again Christian, when you're sinning, you're sinning against God. And only, right here, is a, and only Him. And if you're poor in spirit, this is, this is, you, you're, you're going to mourn because you're, you're failing your father. That's the way you look at it. You're failing your father. You've done something, and, and that's, the way, that's the way we feel. That's the way we should feel because we know where our father has brought us from. Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. So right here it's saying, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. Godly sorrow. And it says it has no regret. That's what it means right here, not to be repentant. It has no regret. When, you, when you're repenting of a sin, you don't have a regret that, that you're having to leave that sin behind. You hear, you hear what I'm saying? It's not like you want to hold on to it and in your mind. and you just, No. When you love the Lord and you know that's a sin against Him, you repent of it without any regret. And that's what it means right here, not to be repented of. Godly sorrow leads to true repentance. And only those, only those of us who are sincere and really desire Him will, will have this. We'll have a true deep mourning over sinning, over the sins we may commit in our lives. Worldly sorrow, it says, they have no penance, repentance. Worldly sorrow, it says it leads to spiritual death. That's worldly sorrow. So we need to have a godly sorrow, a, so a godly mourning. As we taught Job last time, we saw that Job said a lot of things about the Lord that wasn't absolutely right. You know, he was kind of mad at the Lord. And he said some things. And in Job chapter 42, verse 5 and 6, Job says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes seeth thee. So Job is saying, hey, after all that complaining he was doing and the Lord showed himself to Job, he said, now I can see you, Lord. In verse 6 he says, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Abhor, that means hate. He says, now I hate myself for the way I, the complaints I had against you. See, that's, this is when you're mourning, this is mourning the, the sins you've done against the Lord. This is the morning we're talking about. He got right down with Job, too. He says, where were you when I heard the stars? <laughs> hey, well, he's, he said a lot to Job. <laughs> Job is a good book. But this is how he felt when he saw the Lord. When he finally saw the Lord. When you see the Lord and what he's done for you. We're talking about seeing. And I'm not talking about physical. I'm talking about when you actually see who your father is and what he's done for you. That's when you see the Lord. And when you truly see that, that's when you mourn. Because you know the way you've been. The morning we're going to see is one that stays with us. Like I said, these other mornings I told you about, they come for a little while, but then they, they should leave. This morning is a morning that's going to stay with us until he comes or he takes us. Now, it's not a continuous day. We're not going to just continue to be mourning. Once you mourn and you ask for forgiveness for that sin, then you're good until you've done another one. Because we're, we're going to sin. It's not a continuous morning where you just stay in mourning. But whenever you do fail, and we do fall, we need to repent of it and just get back on our feet. Praise the Lord until the next time. Well, Lucifer will uh, wage war against us because he don't care about the unsaved. They're just counting But once you become a believer, he'll, he'll aim at you. Try to find your heel. <laughs> oh yeah, and that's what I tell people. Uh, I tell people when you're first, I tell you, young Christians when they just get saved. I say, you know, now that you're wanting to give your life to the Lord, now the devil's really going to tempt you. Now he's really going to come after you. And then I tell brothers and sisters who are already Christians, same thing. When the Lord sees that you're wanting to get closer to Him, that's when He attacks you more. Because it should devastate us. Because we know we've sinned against us, against Him. Really, it should devastate us when we hurt our Father. Because that's what it does to Him. It hurts Him because we've sinned. Okay? And that sinning is, is uh, 
Some takes some people take sin in very lightly. All right, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna get more on that in a minute. But this kind of morning, out of all the mornings they have, this kind of morning is the most severe out of all of them, because this is against God. You know, I like to use the scriptures to explain the scriptures. So we're gonna go to Luke chapter seven, and I'm gonna read verses thirty-six through forty-three, and then forty-seven through fifty. Verse thirty-six. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And I'm speaking about Jesus here. And behold. And the word behold. That word behold in the Bible means put on your seatbelt. God's getting ready to say something. When you read the word behold, it's not just behold. It's like a, a bomb. Be, behold, you know. He, he's going to show us something. And it says, A woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with her hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now, the, when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake with him himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner. Now this Pharisee, they, had, they were very rich people, well off, and had a lot of power. And this, so they were, they were very wealthy, and I'm, I'm sure Jesus was in, in this big old mansion house. And this woman, this woman, who, was, who says was a sinner, she comes in there. And, and she knows she's not wanted at all. But she comes in there, and she doesn't care what they, what they wanted. She didn't care how they reacted. Because she knew, she knew she was a sinner, and she knew she needed the Lord. She was poor in spirit. Okay, she humbled herself to the Lord. In fact, it says she couldn't even face Jesus. She couldn't even look at Jesus. Just like I told you about Peter. When Jesus, when you realize who Jesus was, Peter said, depart from me. Because Peter said, was thinking, this is the Lord. I, I shouldn't even be in front of him. This is the Lord. This is the Messiah. And this is the way this lady was here. She couldn't even look at Jesus. She was behind him when she washed his feet and kissed his feet. Jesus wouldn't ask us to do anything unless he's been through it himself. Now, this is the way this, this lady humbled herself to the Lord, showing her poor in spirit, shown in her mourning for her being a sinner. Jesus, if you look at Jesus, Jesus was in heaven, in heaven. We can't comprehend what heaven's like. Our little minds and their little compared to the Lord. We can't even comprehend what heaven is like, but we know it's, it's great. Um, there's all kind of words you can use for it, but I'm just going to say that. But Jesus left heaven, left heaven, to come down here, to come down here on this earth, this world, which compared to heaven is, is filth. Is, we're live, this is a garbage can, okay, compared to heaven. We're, in a, we're living in a garbage can. And he left heaven to come down here for us to live here. And then once he, get, once he got here, the Bible says we despised him and we rejected him. Now, this is Jesus, left heaven, came down here to this earth, and even on top of that, we despised him and rejected him. But he did it. This woman, knowing she was very unwanted in this house, very unwanted, didn't care. She didn't care. She, she knew what she had to do. Now, we as Christians... How far do we go to show the Lord how much he, we love Him? The Lord showed us. He left heaven. He showed us how much He loved us. Now how do we show Him how much we love Him? Do we do things, do things in front of people not caring what they think because we know this is the right thing? If they look at us as being idiots, then so be it. But this woman... She was very serious. She took sin very serious. When she realized who Jesus was, I'm sure when he came on the scene and he, she saw 
This must be the Son of God. This must be the Messiah. This is what she did. She took it very seriously. Very seriously. You know, we... Like I said a while ago, we, sometimes we take sin and we laugh at it. There are sins that we laugh at. We think it's funny. I say that because uh, I've seen it, and plus I'm guilty of it myself. But as we know, there is no categories of sin. Sin is sin, period. Now we as Christians should, should remember that. We shouldn't be laughing at sin. It's a very serious thing when, when, when we're looking at it or when we're committing sin. Uh, you know, when, we, when the Lord shows us something, He's not condemning us. He's just showing us so we can repent of it. So we can get closer to Him. Okay, remember that. Always remember that. I'm not in here and the Word's not in here to condemn you, to bring you down. It's here to help you get closer to the Lord. Now these Pharisees, these are religious men. These were men who re- who had the five, first five books of the Bible memorized. They had Psalms memorized. These were religious men. They were supposed to be knowledgeable on the scriptures. And they said, if this man would have known who touched him, this prophet, I mean, well, you know what? A, a prophet doesn't know everything. A prophet is someone that the Lord uses to speak through. But they said, if this man would have known, this prophet would have known, well, prophets don't know everything. All right. They only know what God reveals to them, too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, a prophet is someone the Lord uses to, 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 to speak whatever it is he wants us to know. That's what a prophet is. In verse 40, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto him, Simon, what have some, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. And that right there, calling Jesus Master, we read the Bible. I've read the New Testament. And being a Pharisee, they did not look at Jesus as being a master. If anything, they wanted to prove that he was a false prophet. So when he said master to him, he that's about as hypocritical as you can get. Calling some someone something you know they're not. But you're making a show like you're you're so good and you know who he is. You know what I'm talking about? We need we need to learn from that. We need to learn from this. If, if, if you have a teacher or a preacher and you're all smiles and good to them and everything, but, but then you go out there and you talk behind your back, it's just as bad as these, these Pharisees here. I mean, these Pharisees did not accept Jesus as, uh, as master. Like I said, they wanted to kill him. They wanted to prove that he was a false prophet so that they could stone him. That's what they did to false prophets. They stoned him to death. That's what we need today. If all these prophets that say they're prophets, we wouldn't have very many prophets if we did the same thing today. Because back then, if you were a false prophet, they stoned you to death. In verse 41, there was a certain creditor who had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. Now this is Jesus speaking to them. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Well, the first thing I want to point out, again, it says, and when they had nothing to pay. This is when you're poor in spirit. When you know you have a debt and you can't pay it. And then this verse, verse 43, Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most, and he said unto him, thou hast rightly judged. So Jesus is saying, yeah, the one who, the one I forgave most on the debt, that's the one who's going to love me the most. So, the question is, and we know each other, and, and plus we know our own selves, how much has the Lord have to forgive us, has had to forgive us? I mean, if you're one of these persons, and I'm not saying anybody in here is that way, but there are people like this, oh, I'm not so bad, you know, I'm not so bad, you know, I don't, I'm a pretty good person. Well, you think that person's going to love the Lord as much as someone who realizes we're nothing, we're sinners. You think that love's going to be the same? No, right here the Lord says the one who's, who has sinned the most, the one who owed the most, is the one who loves him the most. And maybe that's why I love the Lord so much. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Because 
Nobody in here named her knows how it used to be. Nobody, except the Lord. I know how it used to be. And maybe that is why, maybe that is why I love the Lord so much. Because I know how much He's had to forgive in me. And because of that, you know, that just proves right here, right there, you know, the Lord forgives. There's nobody out there that the Lord can't forgive. I know one of the things my daddy, uh, he, was, he was in five major battles when he was in the Army. Five major battles. And he told me, he says, there's no way God can forgive me for killing those men that I killed. There's no way. And of course, you know, I told him what I needed to tell him. But that's what he felt, that God could not forgive him. Paul was killing Christians. Killing Christians. Christians. Not just men. He was killing Christians. And the Lord forgave him. Just remember, there's nobody out there that can't be forgiven. The only ones that can't be forgiven are those who reject him. But even it. Paul made a comment on it. He said, I'm the cheapest of sinners. When he mm-hmm. was convicted yep. by Christ, he said, he realized, he said, I'm the cheapest of sinners <laughs> in the light mm-hmm. of Christ. <laughs> and when I read that, I'm thinking, well, Paul, I'm right under you then. I'm right <laughs> under you. <laughs> Praise God the Lord touched my heart. Praise God. Okay? Because I, I tell you right now, if, if I wouldn't have found the Lord at 25 years old, I wouldn't be here. I know I wouldn't be here. Because like I said, my two best friends, one was my cousin, one was just a friend. The two, two of my best buddies are already dead from drugs and alcohol. They're dead already. And I was on the same road as with them. I was right there with them. But the Lord opened my eyes and I found the Lord. Okay? And it's because I'm here. Because of that, I'm here today. But if it wasn't for that, you know, mourning, mourning is, is, is a cry for release. To release the, the sin you've committed. It's in Romans seven twenty four, it says that Jesus has set us free. Jesus can set you free from your sins. Mourning is a is a crying out that you don't want this sin in your life anymore, because it's against the Lord. Lost people don't understand that that in Christian life, we have to mourn before we can receive true happiness. True happiness. Because before we can receive true happiness, we need to realize where we're at. How we are nothing without Christ. And then after you realize that, then you start mourning because you're that way. You're a sinner. You've, and you're, like I said, it says you're against, you sin against God and Him only. So when you have true forgiveness from the Lord, which we get, that's, that's what brings us true happiness and peace. It really does. Because you, you know where you're at. You know where you was going, and because of the Lord, now you can have true happiness and peace because you know you're not on that road anymore because of what the Lord's done for you. The fruit of a mature Christian is not one who's trying to be sinless. It's the one that's aware of sin. Uh, Like I said, some of our sins, we think nothing of them. If it's a big sin, then we're like, oh... Like they call them the old white lies or, oh, that's the little sin. There's no such thing. Sin is sin. But this is where true repentance comes in. True repentance is when you're mourning over the sin you've committed against God. And now let's drop down to verse 47. Verse 47 says, Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which referring to the lady up above, which are many, which are many, he says, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little was forgiven, the same loved little. Which we already talked about that. Now Jesus, right here, I had, like I said, I got like, these papers right here, I got like about ten pages of these papers to show Jesus is God. I did a teaching on it. I think y'all were there. Mm -hmm. I did a teaching on, is Jesus God? And I've got about ten pages of nothing but scriptures to show that Jesus is God. Right here, right here, verse 48. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. Right there it shows who Jesus is. Plainly he shows it. Verse 49. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, who is that? Forgive the sins also. Like I said, these religious leaders could not recognize the Messiah, the Son of God. They couldn't recognize Him. In 2 Chronicles 7.14, If my people, this is speaking, God is speaking here, 
If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. This is what God said in the Old Testament. God said, I will forgive them. Right here in the New Testament, Jesus is saying, your sins are forgiven. Now, who's the only one who can forgive sin? God. God. So right here, these, these religious people, they, they should have fell to their knees. They should have. But they didn't. Also in Mark 2, 7, Why doeth this man thus speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? Well, that's a true statement, though. Yeah, it's a true, it's a true statement. <laughs> yeah. But right there should have told them who Jesus was. They should have known the Messiah was in their midst, right there with them, with that statement. Either that or, or he was a false prophet. But over and over, he showed he wasn't. But then after a little while, they were like, well, the people are following him instead of us. They're turning to him instead of us. And they love that power. They love the power of being uh, a religious, well, we're all ex-Catholics, well, not all of us, but there's a lot of ex-Catholics in here. They were like the religious leaders that we have today. The Pope who goes down the street and he's accepting all this worship and all this praise to himself. He's accepted it. This is what the religious leaders were. They were just like that. And the thing that makes me angry is that he says he's above sin. And Paul said, nobody's above sin. Paul said, A-L-L. -L. The Pope said that? Who said that? The Pope. The Pope has said that? Yeah. I guess I didn't hear that one. Yeah, they, they call him the Holy Father. So the new Pope or John Paul the one before? The one before. And, you know, and, and that's why I say, it, Jesus saw that blasphemy that was ahead. And he said, don't call any man on earth your father spiritually. He said, you only have yep. one father in heaven. Yep. I think he looked at Paul, uh, he hadn't saw that blasphemy that was coming. Well, it was, it was verses like that in Matthews that I read. Do not give anybody, do not call anybody f your father, which you only have one father, and that's in heaven. Yeah, so, but that's what they call him. And uh, I read that as being a Catholic. Yeah. Like I said, I, I started reading the Bible myself because I had too many religious religious people telling me what was what. And when I read that, I was like, and then I read other stuff. And then I read that Mary said, I rejoice in God my Savior. Well, wait a minute, Mary's perfect. How, what does she need a savior for? She's sinless. And I read stuff like this and I got I got out of the Catholic Church. <laughs> so that's I got out of the Catholic Church because of stuff that I was reading like that. Now, you know, it's not the Catholic people that I dislike, but it is the religion. Yeah, yeah. It's it's they, they teach a lot of faults. A lot. Especially when they talk about praying people out of purgatory. There's a lot. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot that they do and say that I totally disagree with. Because I mean, you look at you look at Mary and the statue and how they pray to Mary and these saints. Well, what's the difference between Mary and and Buddha, the little fat man? What's the difference? Well, they had. Remember at the beginning, before I started, I went back to chapter four where it said he had a great following. But he had a great following. Why? Because he was healing everybody. Well, good thing we have the Bible we can read and we know how. And the Old Testament speaks about it. You know, the, I hope you all believe this, but the, all of the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament points to Jesus. All of it. Okay, getting back to verse 50. And he said, just as Jesus, And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Now he didn't say, Your works have saved you. These things that you've done to me, it doesn't say that's what saved you. He said your faith has saved you. Her faith that Jesus was the Son of God. Her faith was Jesus was the Messiah. From her heart, when she, when she realized that, from her heart, she responded. And that's the way she responded. Kissing Jesus' feet. The word hath, right there, thy faith hath saved thee. Another teaching I had is once saved, always saved, eternal security. You know, the word hath, anybody an English teacher? The word hath means has. Has. So he's saying, he's saying that she has salvation. That's what saved is. She said you have it. And there's many scriptures like that. You got it. He didn't say you're working for it. The Bible 
I mean, to me, it, it's just people don't know how to read the Bible. Because I, I, when I first started reading the Bible and I read a verse that said, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. I'm Baptist here. And they believe in eternal security. But right here it says, He that endureth to the end shall be saved. But then as I grew and I learned how to read the Bible, well, that verse is talking about people in the tribulation. It's not talking about us now. It's talking about people in the tribulation. So we need to learn. People need to learn how to read the Bible. Who is the Lord speaking to in this chapter? Who is He? Who is they? Who is I? You know, we read the word they or we. Okay, who's the we? Or who's the they? We just read it and we keep going. We need to learn and recognize, okay, who's the Lord speaking to? That can, that can help a whole lot when you're, when, when you're confused about something. This is where we get our comfort. Like it says in the end of verse 4. For they shall be comforted knowing that God has forgiven us. That's where we get our comfort. Knowing that the Lord has forgiven us. Hebrews 10.17 And their sins and iniquities I will remember no more. <laughs> oh. We all, we all have a smile or amen on that one, okay? So our comfort is, is by this, by knowing that we're, we have forgiveness. We come to Him mourning, mourning over the sin we've committed, but then He comforts us because he, we know that He forgives us. We know that He forgives us. That's, that's part of our faith, knowing that His Word says He will forgive us. If it comes from here, if it comes from here, or from the heart, our sins when we repent of sins, have mourn over sin, it comes from here. Uh, we have people out there, I, I hate to stay on the Catholics, but, you know, every Saturday or Sunday, they go in confession, and they confess about the same sin, knowing they're going to do it next week. Forgive me for, I got drunk this last night. Okay, we'll go say so many Hail Marys, Our Fathers, knowing they're going to do it next week and again. All right? This is not from the heart. This is not true repentance. Repentance means you're turning from that sin. That's why we mourn over it. When you mourn over it, that means you want to get rid of it. It also says in John 14, 16, also 14, 26, also 15, 26, and in 16, 7, it talks about the Holy Spirit being our comforter. The Holy Spirit here is here to comfort us with the Word of God. We... I don't, don't ask me where this gray hair came from. I don't know. But it's not because I'm, I'm, I'm not being comforted. The Lord, I take a lot of stuff and, okay. You know, just like I said the other day, you know, He's not going to put anything on us that we can't handle. That's a big comfort for me. Because that tells me, God is telling me, if this is happening to me, it's because He knows I can handle it. Now this comfort, this comfort is for now. You know, it's for now. Knowing that He forgives us and, and the scriptures I just gave y'all, that's for now. But also we have the comfort of the future. You know, we, we've read the last book. We've read it. We win. We know that already. And there is a place in heaven for us. He said He's going to prepare it. We know this. So our comfort is also in that. It's not only for now, but our comfort is for the future also. We know where we're going. If we're born again, born again Christians... We know where we're going. Again, I don't know where this gray hair comes from, but it's, it's not from reading this because I read this and the Lord says, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. <laughs> Amen. You know, God's words, if we believe Him, I mean, if we truly, truly believe Him, truly believe Him from the heart, we should keep a smile on our face. Oh yeah, We really should. You know, it's not like I go to bed tonight Oh, Lord, forgive me for lying to this person. And forgive me for that, and then I just go to sleep. Wake up the next morning, and I just, you know. No. If you're asking for forgiveness, I mean, you really, you're on your knees saying, Lord, please forgive me. I mean, you don't have to beg them, but that's the way I feel. I know I don't have to beg them, but that's the way I feel. Because I'm constantly just comparing myself to the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm. Okay, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Verses 16 and 17. Now our Lord Jesus Christ Himself, and God, even our Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work 
word and work. I just read this verse because this is this should be a comfort to us. This verse right here should be a comfort. To, he's the one that gives it to us. When you believe the word of God, when you believe the scriptures, totally believe the scriptures. That, that's nothing but comfort in here. And this is why I don't read other books. I don't. Other men, I mean, there's good teachers out there. I'm not saying there isn't. But I like to go to the main one. Like I said, verse 3 and verse 4 goes together. Because we've got to be poor in spirit. When we get poor in spirit, then we, we know what sin has done. And it should, it should warn us that we sin. Psalms 97.10. It says, Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. The Lord says, if you love Him, hate evil. That's sin. That's why I was telling you earlier, we shouldn't be laughing and joking about sinful things. And like I said, I'm guilty myself because there's some comedies on TV that I watch and I should not be watching them. It's nothing but showing adultery in there. They're funny shows and I laugh, but then spiritually, really, I shouldn't be watching that. And you got it's just careful. promoting sin. We need this, this morning, we should take this very serious. We should take sin in our life very serious. <sighs> I mean, I've showed you a woman who took it very serious. I mean, she couldn't even face Jesus. She got behind him. Now, back then when they sat at tables, usually their feet were behind him. So she was able to kiss and wash his feet behind him. It's not like they sat out with their feet in front of him. Yeah, they were quiet. Yeah, so this is the way we should feel. We should feel this way. We should not take Christianity as, okay, I'm a Christian and just go about living your life. Christianity is a change in your life. This is what Christianity is. He says, when he says you're a new creature, the old man is dead, this is what he's talking about. Now when you sin, it's going to hurt you. It's going to devastate you that you've sinned against your father, the one who's given you life. Remember, we were dead. We were all dead until we accepted Jesus. He's the one who's given us life. We have life because of our father. And because of that, we shouldn't take sin lightly at all. And that's why this morning, that's what it's talking about. Isaiah 55, 6 through 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to God our, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon us. This word forsake means to turn, means to repent, to turn from our sins. They have preachers out there that just talk about confessing, confessing your sins. Well, unless there's confession and repentance, confession means absolutely nothing. Repentance follows confession. Proverbs twenty-eight thirteen: He that covereth his sins shall not prosper. People... People who try to hide their sin, it says right here, they're not going to prosper. But whosoever confesseth and forsakes them shall have mercy. So those who confess and repent of them, those are the ones who's going to have mercy. So this confession stuff, again, like the Catholics, you confess, you know. But there's no repentance there. Because like I said, they do it over and over and over. Confession and repentance goes together. No use. There is no use confessing sins to the Lord if you're not going to repent of them. Now, this is what helps me a lot. James 4, verses 8 and 10, through 10. It says, Draw nigh to God, and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Double-minded means those who are trying to be a Christian and live in the world. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and let your joy to heaviness. It says, take the fun of sinning out and mourn over it. That's what he's saying right here. Don't look at it as fun as the laughter anymore. It's, it, you should mourn over sin. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Humble yourselves beside the Lord. We, uh, mourning, I'm just, uh, this, this morning, blessed those who mourn, the bottom line is sin should bother you. And I'm not talking about big sins. I'm talking about sin, period. That should bother us. And when we can not only laugh at it on TV or whatever, I'm talking about if you have sin in your life, 
Take it serious. Don't just don't wait till all day, okay, and then at night you go to bed and say, Okay, Lord, forgive me of my sins. That's not taking it serious. If I've sinned right then and there, Lord, forgive me. I'm, you know, right then and there you ask for the forgiveness. That's taking it serious. But when you wait and just pile it up there today and then at night you just throw them in one pile and say, Forgive me, Lord, for sinning today or whatever, that's not taking sin serious. Do you understand what I'm saying? The closer we get to God, we see more of our sin. The closer we get to Him, the more we see of our sin. But it says, draw now unto Him, and He'll draw now unto you. Get close. That's the best. You know, fighting the devil is not screaming and hollering at Him. You know, there's some religions out there, they get in their prayer, and they're all screaming at the devil. And you know, we bind you, and we do this, and blah, blah. When you're praying, who do you pray to? You're praying to a God, those who pray. All right, they're praying to the devil, saying this. They're talking to, they're addressing him. So to me, they're just recognizing him as being a God. Because you pray to God. That's what people pray to. They pray to their God, whoever their God is. But that's what prayer is. It's someone praying to their God. But when you're out there hollering and screaming at the devil, that's recognizing him as a God because you're praying to him. Well, the Bible says, the Word of God says, the best way to fight the devil is not to scream and holler at him. The best way to fight the devil is to get closer to the Lord. That's the best way to fight the devil. Get closer to the Lord. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 2 and 8. Now, this is, this is the way we should be. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. He's talking about the future here. We... We can't wait to be with the Lord, to be clothed with His righteousness, full righteousness. What the Bible says right now, we see through a glass darkly, but pretty soon, we're going to see clearly. And we, should, we, we, we can't wait for this to happen. Verse 8, we are confident, I say, and, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. We're ready to be gone from these bodies and be with the Lord. Yeah, we, 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 should be, we should be ready to, to get out of this filth that we're in. Yeah, we're leaving, we live in broken bodies. Mm -hmm. Now, we shouldn't go commit suicide just so we can both be with the Lord, okay? <laughs> I mean, uh, be careful there. <laughs> but that's the way we should look. We should look forward to what's, what, what He has for us.